Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of the live stream on Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to everyone who has uh, watched the previous video and has visited my blog over the last week. If you do find these videos useful or if you find any of these things interesting, please do uh, give, me, give me a like or send me a comment or feel free to share them around so that we can I can work on kind of trying to improve these sessions uh, as we move forward and I aim to do more as the lockdown commences. So today we're going to build off what we looked at in the first part of the live stream series uh, in relation to Michel Foucault but today we're actually going to focus on his book Discipline and Punish the Birth of the Prison. So we're actually going to get to the, the main content that we need to discuss. Now, last time or in the uh, last online lecture that I did, we were mainly talking about Foucault's historical method, um, how he developed his ideas, and we took a brief look at madness and civilization. I'd recommend that you take a look at that before you take a look at this one, because it'll give you an idea of what Foucault is doing as a historian and as a philosopher too. So without further ado, let's get into Foucault's discipline and punish. And we need to begin in the feudalist period, particularly uh, kind of the medieval period uh, an early slash early modern period as Foucault likes to begin with. So what we see up on the slide here is a stereotypical form of justice being delivered in the early modern period. What we see is we have uh, an executioner, we have a criminal and we have local crowds. And what has happened here is the person, the criminal, has committed a crime and he is about to lose his life in front of all of these people. Now, Foucault does a really interesting analysis of why this is an important event or an important case of how to understand justice in this historical period. OK, so what we see here in this image is we have executioners and we have priests. Now, both of these individuals are there to represent the will of the sovereign. Law in this uh, period is mainly set by the sovereign or the monarch, as uh, the monarch has been given their position through what was assumed to be the divine right of kings. It's God-given law, and so therefore breaking the king's law is breaking, God, breaking God's law, so you need a priest in order to kind of sanctify it in a certain sense. But then you also need the executioner to enact the will of the sovereign because he can't that they can't be seen as getting their hands dirty themselves. So the executioner is the hands of the sovereign and uh, the priest kind of represents the soul of the sovereign in a certain way. So we can see a clear connection there between who is ruling, who is at the top of society and how justice is being delivered by uh, this person. We then see we have the criminal who has their heads uh, placed forward about to be chopped off. Um, now, it's really important to notice where the punishment is taking place on the criminal, Foucault points out. He argues that, for, say, if you've gone in, into the market and you've stolen something and you have been caught, the way that you would repay your debt or the way justice is to be served is by taking punishment on the body. So if you've stolen something, then they might chop your hands off, for example. So you would repay or justice would be served by sacrificing maybe part of your body. If you committed a more heinous crime, then you would uh, have your head chopped off or other more brutal forms of punishment happen too. It's important to note, it, note as well that in relation to the criminal, Foucault also notes that during investigative stages of criminal proceedings in this period, uh, the body would also be used to draw out confessions from the criminal that has committed the act. So that could be by breaking fingers, chopping hands off, or even more brutal forms of punishment that could happen uh, if you had committed a crime or gone against the will of the sovereign. So really key thing to remember is that at this stage, if you've committed a crime, punishment is taking place directly on the body of the uh, victim of, uh, of the criminal who has been accused. The final thing that we see in this period are crowds or local crowds or an audience. And Foucault argues that in this period, punishment has to be a spectacle. Punishment has to be seen to be working. And this has to happen for the main reason that, well, a couple of reasons, really, that the king has to be seen 
to be enacting his will and his laws, that there that there are consequences for breaking the king's law. And it also demonstrates to the audience what those consequences are if you break the laws of the monarch. So you need a spectacle. It needs to be seen in order to maintain the power of the king. This is how the king shows the power that uh, he holds over society. Could also potentially be a queen in this case. But this is how they maintain order and maintain control. You need the audience there to see this spectacle, to reinforce uh, the power of the sovereign. There are, of course, various other forms of punishment that took place on the body of the criminal during this period. So this one is uh, one that Foucault uh, talks about at the beginning of Discipline and Punish when he's describing in uh, excruciating detail the uh, punishment of uh, a particular individual who has been tied, or all four of his limbs have been tied to a horse. They have been encouraged to run in different directions, ripping and tearing the uh, kind of limbs from the body of the accused. So again, it's important to notice punishment again is taking place on the body of the criminal. We also have the stocks, of course, where you would be uh, chained up and people could throw things at you. So this links to the notion of the spectacle. Punishment has to be seen by the audience and has to be seen to be working. And you kind of see the threat of the monarch there too. Uh, in one of my more favourite ones, which... Uh, always makes people more squeamish is of course the wheel where you'd be tied to a wheel and spun around until all of your uh, limbs and um, parts kind of came <laughs> came apart a rather brutal punishment uh, that was kind of in enacted during this period but again punishment is taking place on the body of the individual and one that always makes people squeamish and a rather extreme form of punishment you must have had to do something pretty bad that is uh, that has happened here but essentially you would be tied uh, upside down and you would be sawed in half, conscious and alive from the private parts right down to your head. So again, extremely brutal, violent form of punishment, but is constantly and always taking place on the body of the criminal. So that's a really important thing to note. So as previously mentioned, just to kind of recap, it is really empower important to have the, the audience involved because it displays the power of the monarch. It shows society who is in control and what the consequences would be for breaking the laws of the monarch. It allows the crowd to the crowd in attendance to witness the power of the monarch, what he or she is able to do to you for breaking those laws. And in some cases, the crowds could even support the execution. So you have uh, Le Combat, where uh, essentially a woman found her husband was having an affair, so murdered the husband of her husband's lover. So her husband was having, just to repeat that, her husband was having an affair, and so she murdered the husband of the woman her husband was having an affair with. And uh, this ended up being a legal case, which ended up in the uh, punishment taking place on the body of the individual. And the Chronique de Paris uh, notice, uh, notes that Many people in the audience cried, give back the gallows because they didn't feel the punishment that was being distributed to this woman was harsh enough. So what we're noticing in this particular case is that the crowd also has a say in the punishment that is taking place on the individual. And that's quite political because the crowd has to witness this power, but can also get involved in the punishments that are taking place. They can be outraged if the punishment is not enough in this particular case where they wanted her to go uh, onto the gallows. Uh, another case would be that the crowd could also revolt against the judgment of the king, that this direct participation or relation of the monarch to the crowd in, attention, uh, in attendance noting the punishment, they could also push against the judgment. And Foucault notes the corn or flower wars of 1775, which was a uh, revolt in France relating to the increase in grain prices, which increased the price of bread. And many people rebelled as a consequence. They were supposed to be punished in public squares. And in uh, several cases, Foucault notes, many people came up onto the scaffolds and freed the prisoners defying the will of the monarch. So it becomes a very contentious kind of 
punishment or this idea of punishment of, as a spectacle becomes very contentious because people can demand harsher punishments or they can actually free the prisoner where they do not agree with the decision or judgment or the monarch. And that is a threat to political power during this period. So it's a problem because it is a direct threat to the power of the monarch and even questions the power of the monarch too. As we move into uh, the later period, particularly um, the kind of 18th, 19th centuries, there appears to be a set of more liberal reformers who want to reform the punishment of individuals or want to reform the legal and justice system. One of the arguments is that justice or punishment in the feudalist period was too harsh and was too violent. We, we cannot consider ourselves uh, reasonable or rational human beings if we are punishing people in such a severe and violent and extreme way. Okay. They also believe, the reformers, that the crowd intervention, as I mentioned in the previous slide, was too problematic. That if the crowd can demand harsher punishments or if the crowd could even free the criminal, if they did not agree with the law or the punishment that was being distributed, this is a problem for the power of the leaders or the rulers of society. How can you maintain a functional society if the majority of people are rebelling against the law and order that you are trying to establish? So the reformers decide, based on these kind of two principles, that justice should punish. Okay, it needs to punish. It is right that justice does punish. Feudal punishment or feudal um, kind of trials did punish the individual in the form of the body. But what the, the key difference that the reformers want to emphasize is that punishment should not just punish the body, but it should also punish the soul. And I think that's a really important um, distinction to make. And I think uh, Beccaria is who Foucault cites uh, for this quote that he notes in the book. So this key difference is slightly more menacing because obviously it's brutal punishment taking place on the body, but the fact that they're wanting to punish the soul suggests something far more deep and far more outreaching. And I think or what Foucault argues that they're directly considering is actually the psychology of a crime, that we are not just to punish someone in the form of body, but also punish them psychologically or try to determine the criminal as a psychological deviant. So essentially, by punishing the soul of the individual or the psychology of the individual, it gives the public a conception of what a good citizen is, what a normal mind is versus an abnormal mind. So if you commit a crime, you clearly are a bad citizen and you have an abnormal mind, which we can psychologically and medically determine through various uh, kind of practices and various studies. But you are a good citizen if you do not commit a crime because you clearly have a normal mind and will fall into place. And a key thing to notice here is that intent is the difference between manslaughter and murder. There is a psychological aspect to that crime which we potentially wouldn't have seen in the feudalist period, that they would look for the, the intent of the individual, the psychological reasons. Did they intend to commit the crime? And that will then determine the punishment of the individual, whereas uh, manslaughter would be, would be different because that's where you would accidentally do it and uh, carries a different weight to the crime you've committed. So therefore, the psychology of the crime needs to be considered and can add more weight to the punishment and the justice that needs to be delivered. Similarly, they also use medical literature, particularly psychological literature, literature as an objective and neutral force. So by medicalizing the uh, minds of individual or trying to find some kind of medical basis for people committing the crime, it means that they can uh, potentially bring something in from academia that is meant to be objective and neutral in order to distribute the power or the laws of the individuals that have created them. So therefore it's somewhat problematic. It's almost as if you've committed a crime and this neutralising medicalised claiming to be scientific which will then justify your incarceration or the punishment that you will receive in the later period. Okay, so psychology becomes more of a uh, important factor in these cases and a more important factor in relation to uh, distributing punishment and distributing 
justice. And that's a really important thing, because if you can define what is normal and what is abnormal and use that as a reason to incarcerate people or punish people, then that holds a significant amount of power because potentially there might not have been anything wrong with that person in the first place. Uh, Foucault actually alludes to in his abnormal lectures, the people who were punished for sodomy, for homosexuality, and that psychologists were brought in uh, in order to neutralize or justify the punishment by presenting objective data that um, is a psychological deviance to be homosexual or gay, and that many people were uh, repressed or punished as a result of that. And psychology and this neutralizing discourse played a key role in the damage it caused to those people's lifetimes. So that's a really important point. So now that we've kind of determined how punishment or justice should be served by punishing the body and the soul, we need to figure out how we reform these individuals, how we change these individuals who are seen as outside of society, as abnormal minds in society. And Foucault argues that they want to control the body in order to control the mind. So if there are any budding psychologists out there, you will know what behaviorism is, and it kind of links off these ideas. They want to model the criminal like soldiers. They want to bring these individuals in. They want to break them down to their core. They want to break them away from the ties that they've had, the identities they had, the people that they have turned themselves into. They want to break that down to the core and rebuild you as a docile subject that Foucault refers to it as a docile subject, someone who is obedient, someone who follows society's rules and someone who does as they are told. And they can do this through various different techniques um, by obviously bringing you in. It could be done through torture. It could be done through isolation. It could be done through mind tricks. So they're breaking you down. They're controlling your body and controlling your mind by breaking you down, putting you into different places and then monitoring how you develop. Foucault also says that following this new development in justice, they produce or introduce the punitive city in order to remove undesirables, for society, from society. So by punitive city, he is directly referring to prisons. They are institutions that are modelled like miniature cities where we can remove these abnormal elements of society and confine them to the outskirts where they cannot be seen. They are moved from public domain, public consciousness to be broken down and rebuilt as new citizens, as docile subjects. So the enclosures allow organisers to control the space that these new people are put in. They can control physically where you go, but they can also do certain things to try and control how you think to rebuild you as an individual. So a key example of the punitive city would be uh, this kind of prison from the 19th century, where we can see we've got various different compartments where different prisoners would stay. I think now nowadays in American prisons, they have different um, blocks or different hierarchies. And depending how dangerous of a criminal you are, the higher up the hierarchy you go. But this would be a key example of a punitive city during this period. And the piece of architecture that is in the centre of the city, we're going to get out onto uh, a little bit later on. But that's a really important piece of architecture that Foucault is going to note. Also note in this image that the prison is on the outskirts of a society, of society, it's in the middle of nowhere, and all of these undesirable, abnormal minds will remain incarcerated in this punitive city. In terms of uh, controlling the body to control the mind, what we see here is actually a prison timetable from the 19th century in England. So what, what this is telling us or what this is dictating is when you eat, it tells you when you eat, it tells you what you'll be doing in the morning, when your lessons are, when you exercise, when you move from one room to another, when you can have recreation time, when you can have yard time, all of these things act or this timetable whilst it looks neutral it acts to control the bodies of the individuals that live within this city to move them from one place to another without much resistance or much force to be obedient to the timetable and do what the timetable says at certain times you will eat at certain times i often link this to my students to school when you're at school, you will notice you will always get hungry around 
quarter past tw- quarter past twelve when your lunch is meant to be, and you your stomach will naturally growl at that time, and that is because your body has been taught or has been controlled to become hungry at that particular time and at that particular moment. So again, it's controlling the body in order to control the mind. Um, Another key example of this would be yard time that we see here. So the timetable tells you when to exercise, when you can go outside, how much exercise you should do, how much movement you should uh, interact with, how much you should um, perform, essentially. Uh, And then finally, there's, of course, the incarceration during the night, where um, I think a good example of this would be in... um, the Stasi in East Germany during uh, communist rule, where they would make you sit in a cell and you would have to sit upright. And if you started to fall asleep, the guards would come in and they would knock on the door and they would wake you up and you would have to learn how to fall asleep upright. It's these kind of forms of mental and psychological torture, which is impacted or enforced upon the criminal, which breaks them down psychologically in order to rebuild them. And that's kind of something that we see in this image that they are being checked on, they are being monitored by the wardens at all times. And this is done to physically and mentally break down the prisoner to rebuild them as an individual. So back to the building that I was talking about in the previous image. So Jeremy Bentham comes up with this idea of the panopticon and Foucault jumps on this and sees it being used in a prison system. So a panopticon is a central building where someone in authority will sit in in order to theoretically monitor all of the all of the prisoners. So if we look at this image here, we can see from this building that you can see every single cell that is within the prison and that is within the confines of the punitive city. Now, if you're in your cell, no matter where you are, you can always see this building, but you don't know or you can't see if anyone is in the building at that particular time. And that's really important because if you don't know whether you're being watched or not, you're going to behave as if you are being watched. So that's a really, really important notion that Foucault is talking about here. So within this panopticon, there would be someone. And if you misbehaved and they saw you misbehaving, the guards would come and they would beat you up in your cell or they would punish you in a more harsher way for breaking the rules. However, you can't see the person looking at you. They can't see you. And so therefore you are going to behave yourself. You're going to act in an orderly manner as if you are being watched. So the panopticon is a key technology to the prison to psychologically control and break down the prisoner to make them obedient because they're going to act as if they are being watched. And so they're going to follow the rules, even if no one is there to watch them. We also see this happening in modern society in various different ways. So Foucault draws a comparison here with this panopticon. He argues that we don't only we don't just see panopticons in prisons, that actually if we look at any public building, particularly if it's from the 1950s up to the 1980s, we can see a panopticon or resemblance of a panopticon in most public buildings. So he says, is it surprising that prisons resemble factories, schools, barracks, hospitals, all of which resemble prisons? Because in public institutions, in uh, many schools, particularly in Britain, there will be a central building where, or a staircase where all teachers, security guards or management can look out and they can see nearly every classroom who is behaving and who is misbehaving and then react accordingly in order to control the individuals who are misbehaving. And this is directly modelled upon Jeremy Bentham's panopticon and the prison that these institutions, schools, factories, barracks, whilst they appear uh, neutral or uh, liberal or giving you some sort of freedom, in reality, 
what they are doing is they are controlling you. They are building, they are breaking you down as individuals and they are then rebuilding you to be this model citizen as defined by the reformers. And this helps or allows society to function as a well-oiled machine. Do you ever wonder why when you were at primary school, you were very creative uh, and you were very energetic and you had a lot of ideas and by the time you came out of secondary uh, education, you have been broken down, uh, lacked encouragement and have lost those skills that you potentially previously had. So this then leads to various memes, which I've taken from the Michel Foucault uh, Moist Meme Mansion, I believe it's called on Facebook. I recommend you join this group. Um, but of course, you have any institution and then we question as to whether we could consider this institution as a prison. Are we living in a prison? Should we question the very things that appear to us as neutral? Is the family not a prison? It presents itself as neutral, but does it not perform the same functions as the panopticon, as the prison, as the control of the bodies and control of the minds to benefit society? Should we not see the workplace as a panopticon, as a means of breaking us down and reconstructing us and rebuilding us uh, in order to make us fit into the ideals of society? Um, naturally, I think I used this one in the last slide or as a picture in the last slide, which links the uh, anime meme to Foucault and is this a prism? And then uh, to take it to its logical conclusion, uh, the ideology, ideology that everything is a prison, thinking that everything is a prison and is that a prison? So is the ideology of you thinking that you live in a prison a prison after all? Um, so that some kind of humorous side notes and it's, it's I quite like memes as a teaching device because they can convey in an image and a, a few pieces of text key ideas or key thoughts that certain thinkers have. So let's go back to the panopticon very quickly and how the panopticon has potentially spread in our everyday lives or has, late, has led to um, societies or disciplinary societies as Foucault and his friend Jules Deleuze categorised them as. So think about yourself in a supermarket or walking around in public. Chances are you will see a security camera or a CCTV camera as you go about your business. In fact, you might even see several CCTV cameras as you go about your business and your daily lives. The thing with CCTV cameras, though, is they actually function exactly like a panopticon in a prison. You don't know if there is someone at the monitor of those cameras actually watching you. You don't know if someone is watching you or not. And so you are going to behave accordingly. You are going to behave as if someone is watching you on those CCTV cameras that could result in a punishment for your action. And you are going to behave correctly. To give you a story, I used to work at a supermarket where the majority of the CCTV cameras went out one day uh, I think only one at the main entrance was, was working, but the majority of people that came in to do their shop acted as they normally would. Uh, they didn't change their behaviours. There wasn't anything particularly deviant about their behaviour or that there was any instigation that there was a change from the norm, even when they had counted up, uh, counted up stock. So it suggests that CCTV cameras are a modern panopticon which has extended outside of the prison to our everyday lives to control our conduct. At a more extreme level, uh, Gilles Deleuze uh, developed Foucault's idea of the panopticon in the 90s to argue that we are now living in societies of control, that the panopticon has extended beyond uh, small arenas modelled on prisons, so factories, barracks, workplaces, and has instead entered our everyday lives, our movements as we move around. Your mobile phone has the ability to monitor you. I wrote uh, an article for Counterfire, which you can access on this blog, which talks about the Chinese government being able to access your phone and judge and rank its citizens. Um, I also wrote a piece in there about Pokemon Go and how this was a successful manoeuvre by collecting data on you and by getting you to move to certain destinations and certain points, they could actually control your movements. So I believe the case was in Pokemon Go, if you visited a certain Pokestop, 
you could be drawn into a Starbucks and then purchase a Pokemon Go uh, Starbucks. So they are controlling your movements and controlling and directing your purchases. You are also going to behave accordingly when you are on your phone because you don't know if you are being watched through your camera. You don't know through the data that you research who is monitoring that data or who that data is being sold onto. Google collects huge amount of data on people every day. It even uh, notes your search history and then sells that data on. That's its, its business model. And so therefore you don't want to be uh, in a situation where in the future they could use this data to control the jobs you get, to control the movements that you have. So the panopticon, we can argue, is potentially extended to wider society. The society is now modelled on the prison that was developed by the reformers in the 17th and 18th centuries. So it's just some conclusions based on these two lectures then. So history is about the interpret interpretation of history, not necessarily the memorization of facts. So I linked this in the uh, last live stream that I did. So feel free to take a look at that when you uh, can. History can also be used as a tool for looking at contemporary society. So what Foucault has done is he's traced back the origins of punishment, the origins of justice, in order to diagnose the conditions that we are living in today. So he's used history to appeal to us in a modern context, that these ideas that have been historically developed actually have a huge influence on our uh, modern day society. Another thing we should take away from this is that the prison did not develop out of humanitarian concerns. So it didn't develop necessarily because the punishment by the king was too brutal. In fact, punishment or prison developed to be more efficient, to punish people in a and discipline people in a more efficient way. Similarly, the prison became a model for contemporary society. This idea of 24 hour surveillance, the idea of behaving yourself, the idea of not knowing when you're being monitored or not, became a model for society in the 20th and later developed into the 21st century. And I would suggest that you read my review of uh, Shoshana Zabrov's Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which is available on this blog. And you can also access it through Counterfire. OK, so I hope you enjoyed that live stream. Hopefully that was clear. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to email me and I'll uh, do my best to respond. And like I say, please share or like these videos or clips or blog posts if you enjoyed them. And hopefully you have learned something from this. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.